It is 10 a.m. If I get a head nod from Emily, I will get started. Excellent. And we get a lot of participants joining us too. Welcome, welcome everybody on this wonderful Saturday morning for our event with uh, One West in the Plan Room. This is going to be an hour long workshop providing lessons learned by experienced and successful contractors. We're gonna learn how to build professional networks, leverage associations, work with mentors, build economies of scale and establish great collaborations that yield strategic advantage and more opportunities. And of course, in this uh, webinar, we're also gonna take the time to tell you a little bit about what the plan room is and what it can do for you. By way of introduction, I am Dr. Robert Garrett. I'm the Brown and Williamson Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University of Louisville. I am also the director of the Fork Center for Entrepreneurship. So if you're a small business owner or in any ways interested in the entrepreneurial community in Louisville, uh, come find me. I'd be happy to talk with you and, and share our resources at the Fork Center with you. Uh, we, we have a wonderful MBA program at the University of Louisville in entrepreneurship, undergrad and PhD programs. And uh, we've also been excited about this collaboration with One West and the Plan Room to develop some community-based curriculums that I'm gonna share with you a little bit later in our agenda today. Uh, but also by way of introduction, I wanna make sure to introduce Yvonne Smith, who is the president and CEO of One West. She's a real estate developer with more than 20 years of experience. Uh, in One West's five-year strategic plan includes commercial and mixed-use development efforts beginning at the 18th Street and West Broadway corridor. She's the founding president of Sustainable Community Resources, which is a real estate develop development firm with offices in Winston-Salem and Greensboro, North Carolina. She earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, and completed executive leadership programs at Duke and Harvard Universities. So she is massively talented and we're excited for her to be a part of our community. And you will hear from her directly in just a few more minutes. Another key player on our agenda today is Kelly Watson. And uh, you'll, you'll hear from Kelly Watson uh, also later today. She's a big part of this agenda. Uh, Kelly is the first equity and compliance officer for the Louisville Metropolitan Sewer District. As the equity and compliance officer for MSD, Kelly monitors and analyzes policy and programs for equity, as well as compliance with legal and ethical principles and standards. Prior to this, Kelly was the first chief equity officer for Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher, providing strategic visionary planning and oversight to advance racial equity throughout Louisville Metro government and oversaw the Departments of Human Resources and the Human Relations position. I'd also like to point out that Kelly received a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science and Policy Analysis from the University of Louisville. So a proud alumnus we have with us today, cum laude, and a Juris Doctorate degree from Vanderbilt University, Diversity and Inclusion Certificate from Cornell University. So I'm pleased to be a part of this panel. Uh, I, I think it's very impressive the credentials of the others that we've got with us today. And uh, with that, we will queue up a short video. Why the plan room is needed is the title of this video. And that video will, will be immediately followed by a presentation from Yvonne West. Uh, please excuse, I'm having a, a brief technical difficulty. Let's try that again, shall we? Oh well, goodness, all the preparation in the world and <laughs> just give me one moment and we will get that running. My name is Joe Palmer. Uh, the name of my company is GP New Enterprise Group. 
and I have been in business for 15 years and we are basically a construction general contracting company um, and as of late we do uh, we offer general contracting uh, management so GC management um, one of the biggest barriers when I began doing federal government contracting was uh, receiving bonding um, it was definitely hard for me to get uh, coming out because I really didn't have a whole lot of capital when I first started. Um, so over the years, the biggest thing that has kind of hindered me throughout the years um, is being able to, to, to get a certain amount of bonding. Um, when I first started um, looking for project bids, I would have to go to the uh, plan rooms, which there was none offered in the West End. I would have to go out in the East End or a little further out. This. If you have some a, a place that has gives you the means of um, maybe even having access to an attorney that knows business or a CPA, um, it took me the longest to understand financials or somebody that can even educate you in in, in financials or what the what um, I had to learn myself as far as with the QuickBooks and getting a CPA and bonding and and uh, knowing about K ones and and all that stuff, but it sounds like you all have the means to, to pull and grab from, from other avenues to, to get all that, so this is. Okay, my name is Yvette Goodwin Jameson. Uh, I'm uh, with Elite Management Enterprise. I serve as one of the managing uh, partners and the administrator. Uh, we, were, we were formally formed in 2010. Uh, we've been serving the, the Louisville area, Kentucky area since um, 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of my minority business owners think that because they put their name on a company or giving the company a name and they're the owner, that that's all and they do, can, you can try to do what you want. That's not the case. And um, I, that has been detrimental, I think, to a lot of, of, of us minorities. Uh, but educating yourself, having the right credentials like insurance, uh, bonding, workman's comp, if you're going to have workers, you got to have those things. Uh, but I, I look more networking, uh, um, more planning, uh, being uh, a, a, a more enhanced technology, uh, such as understanding how to imprint blueprints and how to understand certain blueprints. Um, hello, my name is Eddie Dunn. I'm president of Destiny Communications and also MCAK, the Minority Contractors Association of Kentuckiana. Uh, my company, um, we're a low voltage provider. We do a lot of different things in technology. It's an um, exciting, uh, always changing um, um, industry. Uh, we do a lot of new construction. I've uh, been doing new construction from inception. Uh, which involves a lot of cabling and, and, and wiring, and we work with, of course, all the different trades uh, in the construction industry. Um, you know, I think my, our barriers are pretty normal, uh, typical barriers that you'll find in construction, and that'll be uh, financial constraints, you know, uh, from, from the estimating side to, I mean, finding the opportunity, the estimating, and then understanding the documents that are in front of you um, to ensure that, you know, you're, you're covering your bases in a project. Those are some of the initial hurdles that I have found um, in construction. Um, yes, there's, there's um, you know, in the past, in my younger years, I just got excited about the opportunities and went, went straight to estimating takeoff and putting a quote together just to find out that we did not meet qualifications or we were going to have to acquire the, the qualifications. So, you know, these are some of the things that I've learned over the years that, that you know, the processes of of actually uh, making a decision to, to bid a, a job, um, the qualifications um, and, and specs and things like that are probably the first things that you should, you should take notice of and, and review so you do not waste any time, precious time that you have as a business owner. You know, finding opportunities and typically that starts with, you know, what's out here to bid in the public eye, um, whether it's public or private type of uh, projects. They're, they're typically found in a plan room somewhere. Um, there are free based plan rooms and there's also s subscription based plan rooms. So, um, and, and not all plan rooms have all the same projects. So, so you need to consider that too when, when you're um, looking at how you're going to do your, your funneling of your, uh, building your pipe and your funnel of your business for future work. The MCAK members, uh, we're, we're waiting to hear, you know, as we know, we just launched, we're waiting to hear 
all that they need. Um, you know, I, I can assume uh, all that they need. I know what we're going to provide. We're going to provide an opportunity for networking, uh, sharing of information, um, also some, some mentorship, uh, getting into some of the areas that, that One West is doing. We'll utilize One West's resources and, and others uh, to ensure that our members get what they need to be successful from the beginning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yvonne Smith. I'm the CEO of One West, and we welcome you this morning. Glad to see everyone out there tuning in. Um, I bring you greetings from our board of directors, which is comprised of community leaders, as well as neighborhood residents and business owners in the West End and from around the, the city at large. This is extremely important, the development of the plan room. Um, I specifically want to uh, bring you greetings from our chairwoman, Ms. Nikki Lanier, who often says, we are going to do this work unapologetically and we are going to create wealth in the West End for the residents and business owners that live there and with them. And as Eddie Dunn just communicated to you, we have to find out what those minority businesses need in order to be able to affect change and help them build their wealth. You all might hear from the mayor often that a billion dollars in investment is happening in the West End. Well, we wanna see that broken down so we can make sure that our minority contractors are getting an opportunity at that billion dollars. That is extremely important. The other thing that is so important for you to know is that our uh, one of our board members, Donovan Taylor, conducted a Young Entrepreneurs Workshop every Saturday, uh, every first Saturday in the month for over a year. And that was to determine what were the needs in our minority community around business development. Well, during that process, several incubators have uh, sprung up and we're excited about them because that's going to provide opportunities for entrepreneurs. But we chose to focus specifically on minority contractors, primarily because we're a development company and we know that if we're able to do $50 million in economic development, we need to make sure that the minority community has an opportunity to participate. We're unapologetic about the fact that the West End is comprised of almost 90% African-Americans, and we are very intentional about seeing those African-American businesses get a shot at the uh, contracts that are coming out. Black and brown contractors do not tend to have access to where are all the contracts and, what, and what, who's doing projects and what do they need in order to qualify for those projects. We're trying to lay that out and make it plain as much as we can with as many partners as we can. We're going to be talking with primes and trying to encourage primes to work with our community and in our community. There are not enough black contractors right now or tradespeople, um, but we do have some success stories that we will be highlighting throughout the term of the plan room. The other thing is we have to make sure that our minority contractors have a place with high-speed Wi-Fi and sophisticated computers and the ability to uh, read blueprints on the computer. So we are making sure that the plan room is staffed well with experienced master contractors to be able to help the, um, the business owners with scaling up their business. If you've been doing business at the 250 gross sales a year or at 50,000 gross sales a year, we wanna see that double, triple, and then quadruple and go even further. And that only happens when you have the right systems in place and the right program in place. So we will be working to make sure all of those, all of those things are in, in place. We also are gonna be challenging owners. We want the good faith effort to be more than a good faith effort. Listen, Equality is not about just making sure the same opportunities are open to everyone. If you've been in a society where there has been a lack of equity or a lack of resources, you have to attack it at that level first to provide what's been missing in order for someone to get to a table of equality. So we are serious about doing that. We are hoping for more um, support financially so we can do more of that. But we welcome you all here today and we want you to know this is about helping the West End to improve and grow 
and to reinvest what has been um, uh, subtracted from the West End. It was once a very thriving area, beautiful homes and beautiful and great businesses that employed people. We want that to, to happen again. And we want to make sure that the West End residents benefit from that. So please, we welcome your questions. We wanna have open conversation, but after 2020 and all the hardship we've all experienced, One West is going to be about results and not just dialogue. So we want you to be a part of this, um, this opportunity and this process. Please go to our website and, and look us up and find ways to get involved. We welcome questions, we welcome understanding, and we're here to try to move the needle for our community. Thank you all for being here. So um, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay on my cell phone here? I am here live today from the plan room facility, and I wanted to make sure that you all had an opportunity to see what we are growing and building here. But before we get into that, I wanted to start with a quick mention of who the partners are that have been working on the plan room and who some of the sponsors are who have funded and assisted with in-kind donations or volunteer hours for the plan room. So uh, an enormous thanks to our partner team. In addition to One West, we are working with Louisville Central Community Center, the University of Louisville College of Business, KPFF Consulting Engineers, the 7 p.m. group, and Interact. Um, our sponsors or funders include some of the same folks and some different. Um, so we want to thank KPFF Consulting Engineers, US Bank, Greeley and Hansen, the James Graham Brown Foundation, the Keynes Foundation, Chevron, Eagle Point, and the University of Louisville College of Business, all of which have been uh, generous sponsors in some way of the program uh, that we're of the facility that we have here before you today. So I'm going to start out as if we're walking in the front door of the plan room. So here we are. When you come in, you can see our administrative area, which is actually the control center for our webinar today. Uh, we also have a blueprint plotter uh, and a blueprint table, which is available for meetings for anyone who would like to um, meet together with other contractors and roll out some blueprints and talk about what you can do together. Here we have our classroom space. Uh, we have some high quality curriculum that's being developed both by the University of Louisville and other partners such as KPFF, LCCC and Interact. Uh, and then as we move towards the rear of the space, these are the co-working or cubicle spaces, which will be available for a short term tenancy for a couple of folks who really want to improve their business and work on uh, some spe specific skills and specialized areas with the team that's at the plan room on site. So there you have it. We are here live at the plan room today. Just wanted to give you a brief preview of what will be available once the space opens. So I will pass the, the uh, baton back over to our wonderful host and MC for the day, Dr. Bobby Garrett. I love to hear that, host and MC for the day. I'll also just alert Emily. I'm sure she's watching these things anyway, but she just was presenting, so maybe she didn't see them. Uh, there are a couple of questions being posted to the chat in Zoom uh, that I'm not really qualified to answer. <laughs> so so uh, we can either save those for the Q&A part, or uh, if you'd like to be active in the chat, uh, maybe get some folks some answers a little earlier than that. Yes, but, thank um, you. So we, we are answering some of the questions live. Um, oh, so if, uh, if you have asked the question, there might be a response coming to you. Um, but if you want to ask a question that the general audience can see the response to, go ahead and put that into the Q&A instead of the chat. So thank you very much. Terrific. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And I just want to reiterate that the, the University of Louisville and the Fork Center for Entrepreneurship, we are so excited to be part of this talented team. Working with One West in the plan room has just been a joy. And um, it's a really important initiative to us. Right? The College of Business and the Fork Center is dedicated to equity and inclusion. And this is a huge, important initiative that we are just thrilled to be a part of. Um, when our dean, uh, Dr. Todd Moradian, came to me late summer, early fall of last year and told me about this, he was just super enthusiastic and really wanted us on board. 
and I just jumped at the opportunity. And it's it's really been a pleasure to work with you all, and I'm so excited about this launch event today. Um, I do want to tell you a little bit about uh, what the University of Louisville has done so far with the plan room, because we went through a major initiative in late last fall to come up with some courses and workshops that we could offer. And I also want to, to recognize Virginia Denny, who leads our executive education department in the College of Business, for helping me arrange this. But what we did, Virginia and I organized four focus group topics and implemented those four, four focus groups, meeting with contractors and subcontractors and procurement agents and architects uh, from all over the Kentuckiana and specifically Louisville region to find out what were some of the critical needs and what were some of the critical skills that um, contractors and subcontractors needed to be successful in this area. So I will share with you now uh, the results that we prepared um, and delivered in a One West meeting. Uh, everybody should now be seeing a um, plan room learning project document. It's got my letterhead at the top. And you'll see here that uh, based on input from a variety of stakeholders, critical competencies were identified. And what you'll see here is a bulleted list of the essential knowledge and skills that successful contractors have. And we bucket them into categories like how to build a, how to build a business, which of course is an area that a college of business can help with. Uh, we also bucketed them into managing projects to ensure quality, timeliness, and business success, managing the business, and using technology effectively, in addition to some other competency areas. Now, what was really interesting about the results of these focus groups is that we were able to learn from participants themselves what they thought was important. A lot of times, I think universities have a tendency to tell people what's important. <laughs> That's not gonna work in this situation, right? We need to listen, we need to hear from y'all what's important and then, and then execute on that. But by having this kind of very inclusive and holistic approach to gathering information about what works and what doesn't work, what we came up with were a lot of competency areas that a college of business doesn't necessarily have expertise in and some, some several other uh, areas where we do have expertise in. So following the identification of these groupings, we then proposed to the plan room a curriculum design. And in this curriculum design, we identified several um, different topic areas that could be presented. Some of them marked with an asterisk are programs that we felt the College of Business could help with. And the other ones were programs that perhaps uh, we could support, but the plan room and other stakeholders would need to develop uh, independently from us. But today is uh, in essence, sort of part one of landing great projects in addition to this soft launch for the plan room itself. Well, we'll talk about identifying opportunities and determining whether or not they're right for your company. In just another minute or two, I myself will talk about uh, opportunity creation and recognition. Uh, we're also working uh, in very short order. I have a meeting with Yvonne and Emily to discuss how the College of Business can help roll out a project management skills for contractors certificate specifically tailored to the contracting industry. Uh, skipping one, I'll also point out that the next asterisk area is management skills for the construction industry where we've identified several topical needs. So each of these you know, kind of certificate programs might involve three or four uh, several week long workshops where somebody can get certified by the College of Business uh, in project management skills or in management skills. Uh, we've also suggested to the plan room that a workshop be developed on effective networking so that uh, the audience can expand relationships and opportunities through that networking. And then finally, there will also be a technology skills in the construction industry workshop. And we are very excited to help launch, develop, roll out these different pieces of the curriculum, we, we, we think, uh, if it doesn't sound too arrogant to say so, we, we, I guess we hope, we hope that this really adds value to the community. Okay, so uh, we were real pleased with the results of this and um, looking forward to rolling that out in very short order. And in fact, like I said, today we are in part rolling out a good piece of that. And now I'll share that first piece that I've prepared uh, so you'll have to indulge the professor here, right? <laughs> like, this is my lecture area. I'll be short, I'll be quick, and I'll make sure that there is one focused thing that we're supposed to learn from this. 
but I prepared a little five minute mini lecture to share with you today on opportunity recognition and creation. And saying that, I will now share a separate screen with you. Except that I have uh, lost the ability to share that. One moment. There it is, found it. If we could indulge Emily, her technical difficulties, I'm sure y'all can indulge me too. Sorry, Emily. <laughs> All right, so uh, what I've got here is the entrepreneurial process. And I got some contact information for you here. So there's my email address and uh, a phone that rings directly into my office. So if anybody would ever like to get a hold of me, I welcome that contact. Uh, really looking forward to interacting more with everybody here. And there's you know different titly things that go along with who I am. But today we're going to talk a little about the entrepreneurial process and the entrepreneurial process is a four step process and I will share all four steps with you today. But the one key thing that we're trying to learn today is associated with this first step, the identification and evaluation of opportunities. So we're going to stall here on this first step and then I'll show you the rest of the process too. But the thing that we're focused on today is opportunities and how to leverage our resources to get opportunities. So the question comes, and we think about this a lot from the academic side of entrepreneurship, are opportunities discovered or are they created? And if you think about it, there's a real critical difference between discovering an opportunity and creating an opportunity. And I've got this analogy question you can see there. It sounds kind of silly, but trust me, this is part of the learning method here. What are you gonna have for dinner tonight? That's the question. So think to yourself. I know not everybody can, can respond <laughs> live here, but think, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? Okay, so let me tell you how you might have answered this question. Uh, for example, you might say, I'm having spaghetti and meatballs for dinner tonight. And if we were in a classroom, I would say to you, well, how do you know that? How do you know you're going to have spaghetti and meatballs for dinner tonight? And my students often say, well, I planned it. Like, I have planned the future, I predicted that this is what I'm gonna have. And so in order to create this dinner, the student needs to go shopping for ingredients, right? They're gonna need noodles, sauce, meatballs, maybe some salad to go on the side, maybe some breadsticks to go on the side, but they now have a shopping list of, well, let me start calling them resources instead of ingredients. They have a shopping list of things that they need to go get from the outside, from a grocery store and bring in. So that's one way you could answer the question, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? And that's the way probably most of us working professionals think about dinner, right? But let me tell you the answer I get most often in a college classroom with young students. They go, I don't know. <laughs> they say, I'm gonna open up the cupboard, I'm gonna open up the fridge and I'm gonna see what we have. And it looks like I've got some old uh, nacho chips, it looks like I got a little bit of leftover ground beef, Looks like I got some canned corn. <laughs> We're gonna have taco salad tonight, right? We are going to take the resources that we have already and assemble them into unique combinations that could be different dinners, right? It just depends what we've got on hand. That is going to, to determine what we have for dinner tonight. Now, there's actually a critical difference between these two ways of thinking about dinner. One of them is predictive. You predict into the future what you're gonna to want to have for dinner tonight. What will be this opportunity that exists in the future that we need to prepare ourselves for? The other way is creative, not predictive, but creative. You take what you currently have and assemble those things into different ways. Well, you can look at it this way. And I know this looks a little complicated, but it's actually really easy. On the left-hand side of your screen, you have this prediction logic. You look into the future, and you say, what are the opportunities? Where will the opportunities be? And that's where you start. That's why on the far left of this left-hand side of the screen, you start with this blocked, you know, squared off, rigid lined opportunity. That is exactly what it is. And in order to exploit this opportunity, I need resource one, resource two, and resource three. That's my shopping list. That's the list of ingredients that I've got to go get. That's the R1, R2, R3, right? That stands for resource one, resource two, so on, right? Okay, now the problem with this sort of logic is that it can be very intimidating for entrepreneurs, right? If Even if you ask me, and I'm, I'm supposedly a professor of entrepreneurship, if you ask me where are the opportunity is gonna be in five years, I can't, I can't tell you. If you had asked me five years ago, what are things gonna look like in the year 2021? 
I sure couldn't have told you, right? Because five years ago, nobody was thinking we'd be in the middle of a pandemic. So this could be very frustrating. It could be very challenging. It's kind of the domain of corporate entrepreneurs, large bureaucratic organizations who maybe have sophisticated algorithms for predicting where market development will go. But if we use instead the right-hand side of the screen, this creative logic, this is much more approachable for entrepreneurs, much more approachable for people like me, and I, and I think for people like you, right? And that is, let's not start with the future. Let's start with the resources we have. That's why in this right-hand side diagram, we have R1, R2, and R3 are the starting points. What do I currently have? And what are the different ways that I could assemble those resources into different opportunities? So I use these kind of cloud depictions to say, well, there's opportunity one and there's opportunity two. Opportunity one requires the implementation of all three of my resources. Opportunity two requires only the implementation of resource two and resource three. And of course, there's other permutations and combinations of these resources that we could have opportunity three, opportunity four, and so on. But the really powerful thing about this creation logic in entrepreneurship is that if somebody else shows up with a new resource, if Yvonne comes to me with resource four, then all of a sudden, maybe I'm not having taco salad for dinner tonight. Maybe I'm having enchiladas, right? If Emily shows up with resource five, maybe I'm having a completely different meal. We welcome new resources. We bring them in to our stable of resources that we can assemble into different combinations. And, uh, and we begin to see the new opportunities that we can create, right? Uh, going back to the left-hand side of the screen, if we engage in this predictive logic and we have a shopping list of ingredients that we need for the future, and Yvonne shows up with a resource, I'm sorry, Yvonne, but she might be really easily dismissed. You say, hey, I don't, I don't need that additional item because it's not on my shopping list. I've already predicted the future and what I need is this. So if we open our minds to the ideas that opportunities can be created instead of just discovered or predicted, then we open ourselves up to greater opportunity sets. And I think this is much more welcoming and friendly to new business development and to entrepreneurs who are starting out. So I'd like to challenge you to dispel from your mind this myth that entrepreneurship and starting a new business is about knowing in advance where the opportunities will be. And instead, start thinking about what can you do with the things that you currently possess. And let me also just provide huge motivation. Look around, right? Like, look at what the plan room has to offer. Look at the awesome resources that are assembled here today to support you. So it's not just about what you have. It's about what you have access to. And I think that we're excited. We're, we are entering an exciting new time period in Louisville where the resources have never been greater and the support that we can all receive from each other has never been greater. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it, frankly. Okay, so I think I actually hit all the points from this next slide, right? We, we already said all this. Opportunities like meals can be created or predictive. They're, they require different logics. And we need to start thinking about creation and not prediction. Now, just to fill out the rest, the entrepreneurial process is a four-step process, like I said. After we identify and evaluate opportunities, we go develop a business plan. And that's going to be another curriculum offering that the college business is going to help uh, the plan room with, is figuring out you know, management skills and how do we develop a business plan. Then you go out, get the resources required, or find access to the resources that are available in your community. Now, admittedly, a lot of times this has to do with financial management right? Not just human resources, physical resources, but financial resources. And that's something that I have particular skills in is teaching entrepreneurial and new venture finance. So I'd be happy to offer that personally. And finally, the entrepreneurial process ends with managing the enterprise, which is another area that the College of Business can support. This is the process that we teach in the College of Business, just four steps. Of course, each step has a lot of detail, but I'm excited to share that with you today. All right, so let me click out of that and stop sharing my screen. And uh, awesome, we are, we are right on time. I can't believe how well the MC and host is driving this agenda, if I can pat myself on the back a little bit. Uh, from here, I'm gonna pass it back over to Emily, who will do a brief overview of our webpage and announcement of the site. And following Emily, she will turn it over to Kelly Watson, who, uh, who will uh, do a lot of finding business opportunities and how to see what your company qualifies for. Miss Emily, take it away. All right, hello again, everybody. 
This is Emily Vitali again, Director of Business Development with One West, and I want to show you our sneak preview of the One West website. Now, our full website has not been completed yet. We're still working on adding some features and getting some of the back end information. So, for instance, some of the sites that we're going to view with Miss Kelly Watson in a few moments will be able to be accessed through the Plan Room website. But for now, we wanted to just let you know how to find our website and how to, um, you know, what kind of features you can expect on there. So to start, you just go to theplanroom.org and it will bring you to our brand new web page. So this is a, um, a temporary version, which as I mentioned, we're adding features and content every day. So make sure you keep coming back to see what's new. Of course, we start by just telling you a little bit about what the plan room is and what we do at the plan room. Um, a listing of some of the classes that you can expect to be offered soon. Um, as you may know, this is one of our first topics that we're covering. Our, our, um, our workshop today is really focused on finding business opportunities, but there are many other areas that we want to cover through the plan room as well as um, one particular course that's being developed for individuals who are looking to get entry into the engineering and architecture fields without requiring a four-year degree. So BIM or Building Information Modeling is a course that we should be coming out with before too long here. Uh, and this course will um, uh, provide access to Revit or AutoCAD positions uh, at architecture and engineering firms. We also have a, a listing of some of the resources that are available, the services that are offered. So um, before long, these are all going to become particular links to different systems that, as I mentioned, we're still developing right now. So everything from new business opportunities to connecting with minority owned businesses to becoming a client of the plan room. And then finally, uh, of course, anyone who is interested in donating or partnering or sponsoring the plan room. We have a, an ability to do that through our website. You can click on this link to make a donation. We will keep our web page up to date with what's going on in construction in Louisville. So for now, we have a, a link to, to view that, but we will also be adding in uh, daily and weekly news stories as uh, different projects are announced. This can be a great way to get in early and find out about what's coming up on the horizon instead of just what's available for bid today. And of course, where will we be without our wonderful, wonderful sponsors and our partners? So we have a, a great group of folks supporting this initiative. Uh, so on the very bottom of the page is the contact form. And actually, if you're up at the top, you can just quickly get to that by clicking on the word contact and it'll bring you down to it. So if you're wondering how to become a client of the plan room, if you just want more information about the programs that are offered, about when, what time frame we anticipate to roll different things out on, feel free to contact us. And that email comes directly to our team and we'll be back in touch as soon as we can. So um, I have the distinct pleasure of announcing our next speaker, Ms. Kelly Watson with uh, the Metropolitan Sewer District of Louisville. And she's going to tell us about finding business opportunities. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm gonna review a little bit of some current activities that are going on right now. And one of them is the task force on equity in contracting and procurement. In September of uh, 2020, the mayor uh, drafted an executive order to address and hopefully be able to provide more opportunities and increase black wealth in the West End. Um, some of the statistics that he went over at that time was that you know, black residents comprise 22% of the population in Louisville, but only 2.4% of the businesses. Um, black college graduates earn $10,000 less than their uh, white college graduates per annum at this point. And uh, black poverty rates are three times as high as white poverty rates. So that's the why, right? So what are, what are we really trying to do? Um, at that time, it was estimated that within the next five years, there will be approximately $5 billion worth of private and public capital infrastructure projects within the city. And so it really is about how do the entities that are doing these projects 
go above and beyond and make sure that we're including diverse businesses and in particular black owned businesses into this work. Um, the co-chairs of the task force are Tony Parrott, who's the executive director of MSD and Paul Thompson, who is the CEO of um, Louisville Gas and Electric, KU. And the membership of the task force is comprised of about 10 different organizations. Uh, in addition to MSD and LG&E is Louisville Metro Government, um, Louisville Water Company, Louisville Metro Housing Authority, University of Louisville, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, uh, TARC, as well as JCPS, and um, I think I mentioned everybody, but if I didn't, I apologize for that. Also, a part of what the uh, group will also be working on is um, workforce development. And there's a subcommittee uh, with members that deal with in particular workforce development, including One West, GLI, Kentucky Anna Works, and the Urban League. Um, like I said, the objectives of the group are really um, very specific. One, they are to develop local labor utilization guidelines. Two, they are to uh, develop community benefits guidelines. And most importantly of all is to establish timetables and goals to increase the expenditures of these entities with diverse and uh, black owned businesses. So one of the things that I am going to talk to you about is how to find these opportunities. Um, as Emily showed you on the website, there will be a link to business opportunities. On that link will be listed the majority of the task force members that I just mentioned and how to find bid opportunities on their page. So I'm gonna to attempt to show you uh, a couple of pages that will then be linked. So let's hope and bear with me on this technical ability of trying to be able to show this website for you all. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see this. This looks like MSD online plan room. Can I get a nod, Emily, if that's what you all are seeing? Okay, thank you. So let's go through this. And I'm gonna start off with MSD because of course that's where I am. Um, and important things, I'm also supposed to talk to you all about looking at qualifications and making sure that you take those into account when you bid. So a lot of these will kind of be meshed in together. Um, Emily, give me like a little signal if I'm running out of time because I can only see you. Um, but let's talk about what we see on this plan room. Um, the first website that you see here, it lists project scopes here, right? What type of projects do you want? Then you see this welcome area. MSD every year at the beginning of the year, and we just did this in January, host an event with the Louisville Water Company that's called the Can You Dig It? Uh, where we do uh, what happens at that event, and it was virtual this year, is we go over uh, the majority of the projects and the timeline for what will be bid out in um, that calendar year, basically. So we just did that. So you'll see a link here. You also see goods and services here. So we're mainly talking about construction here, but if you are looking to uh, figure out what does MSD buy, what else do we need, you will find that here at this link at 2020 goods and services. That was also revealed at the Can You Dig It that happened in um, July. And that's what this looks like here, okay? Um, you'll see, let's see if I'm able to scroll down. And it tells you the expiration date, the bid number, and the when these things will expire if you are in a position or know of any other companies that will provide those, those services. So let's go back. Let's see if I can go back. <laughs> Okay, good. What you see here below here are the actual bids that are out right now in the plan room. Um, I am not able to click on these at this moment because I am not registered. So let's talk about what that looks like and how you would need to register. So as you can see, we've got several out here at this moment. Um, and you can see the dates and things that they were put out there. If you would like to get and look at these bid opportunities and actually like what the qualifications and the scope of work is, you now you will then need to register uh, and sign in to this site and list your company and provide that information. Um, when you do that, you will then begin to have access to the online bids and opportunities that we have on MSD. You'll also be putting in your business codes so that you will then be sent a kind of alert that will tell you when something else that we have is out there for MSD. 
Um, MSD's goals for supplier diversity, particularly for construction, are 18% for uh, Black-owned businesses, uh, almost 2% for Asian American-owned businesses, and 14, almost 15% for women-owned businesses. In engineering, our goals are 15% minority and 6% for WBEs. Uh, a couple of years ago, MSD conducted a disparity study. In the course of that study, we discovered that we did have underutilization in several categories, in particular those in construction. And that's why you see a increase um, from what that goal previously was for Black-owned businesses up to 18% now. Um, it's important, and I say this because as we're looking at this, and I'm gonna talk about something that I'm sure people think are a little touchy, but we're gonna talk about certification for just a minute here. Um, MSD requires that our uh, diverse businesses be certified. We will take the certification of uh, Tri-State Minority Supply Diversity Council. We'll take the certification of the Human Relations Commission, which is free, I will note that it is not a member-driven certification, but you will have to have had an on-site visit for MSD to accept that certification. We take certification of NABO, which is the National Association of Women Business Owners, and I believe there's a few more. So as you begin to think about who you wanna do that work, that certification is important because many of the entities that are part of the task force that I mentioned accept different certifications, but for most of them, certification is a requirement and I do understand the tediousness of it, but um, I don't see people not wanting to accept certification or requirement certifications anytime soon. So it's definitely a process that um, if you're planning to do business with a, uh, a public or quasi-public entity that you'll probably have to become um, certified. So I'll show, I'll click here, even though this is not a, a construction one, and what, will, what you'll see here is where you will register. So if you are new, you click here. If you uh, have been registered before, you need to recover your name, you will do that here. It comes back to you automatically and will then show you how you will register and then you will then have access to, um, to that bid. The next site that I will go through with you really quickly is a water company. So here you see a difference here. They've got their, uh, they've got bid results. They've got goods and services. And you'll see that most entities will separate their construction and construction related from their goods and services on their site. And here you've got engineering. Now qualifications to deal with water company, they will require you to do a pre-qualification application. Let's see if it, thank you. It's a little slow. I was getting a little nervous there. Um, so here you will find the pre-qualification application and instructions. That is a requirement to do business with the water company. Um, I'm not gonna go in a lot of detail on that, um, but you'll have that there for you to complete before you can um, actually provide bids. Um, the goals for the water company are 15% minority and 5% for women-owned business. Here you'll see bid opportunities on that link. Um, and these are, um, they're, looks like they're putting their goods and services on here eventually, but right now these are what you'll see in their engineering and construction related type of projects. So once again, to get to those, you'll see this link here, the electronic plan room, and that's where you'll find the construction links. And then here is Bonfire, which is their electronic bidding system. So you will have to register in Bonfire as well as do your pre-qualification application. Once you register in Bonfire, very similar to what I talked about with MSD, you'll put in your business codes. You will then start to receive um, electronic bid opportunities or a notification that those are out there, as well as this will be what you will see what is required for that, uh, for that bid or that proposal. Uh, whatever additional documents they may have, they will include that there on their uh, bonfire system. That is their purchasing system that they use. Um, let's look at Louisville Metro. Um, where's I here? So you would go to, uh, eventually the link will have the plan room there, but how did I get here? I went to louisvilleky.gov into purchasing and then this is their procurement portal for Louisville Metro government. And it is everything. 
Um, you'll see here the open opportunities listed. You'll also see past public opportunities. The good faith effort goals for businesses uh, for Louisville Metro government are 15% minority, 5% female, and 0.5% for a disabled business owner. Um, you will see here, and let's do, let's see if I can find one. Let's do Louisville Riverbank stabilization. Louisville Metro government also uses Bonfire. Um, so there are several things that you would have to do to make sure that you're doing business with Bond, with Louisville Metro government. One is to be pre-qualified with the Human Relations Commission. You will also need to register on Bonfire and register on Demand Star. I apologize, I know that seems like a lot, but there are three different systems over there. And to get all the information that you'll need, you'll need to be included in all three. Um, what you see here as you go down, and uh, this is still open, looks like um, the uh, open day, there have been some questions, all of these information you'll see, it's open, uh, it, it opened on the 4th, there's still questions that have been submitted, all those things are viewed online. What is this project? This looks like this project is requesting bids for riverbank stabilization at the Shawnee Golf Course. And it includes tree removal, EPSC grading, stone placement and compaction, and asphalt paving. So as you scroll down some more on this website, I'm having issues with my mouse, there we go. You will see that um, other things that have occurred with this project. You'll also see the commodity codes. And um, there was a pre-bid meeting and there's still being questions that were submitted even as of yesterday and the deadline looks like it was yesterday. Um, supporting documents. This is important as you think about what you want um, to do and whether or not you'll find the scope. So here you'll see all the other requirements that are, you'll see the specs has a PDF, instructions on how to submit your bid, um, Good info here was the pre-bid sign-in so you can see who else um, is attempting or interested in this bid opportunity. GFE are their good faith effort documents and this is the actual bid form and the acknowledgement of a, a pre-conference construction. So down here, you'll see what is required. So what they're asking you to put together for this bid, you'll need to complete your good faith effort documents, your acknowledgement and preferences, your signature page, they want to know if you have done similar projects and references from those projects, uh, three projects of a similar size, um, key personnel, they want your resumes, um, inventory of equipment to make sure that you're still able to do that, I'm sure. Um, bid bond, I think on the video, one of the um, MBEs talked about the bonding requirements that is here the price is here and the bid form. And so all of these will need to be completed to remain responsive for this bid. Um, I do wanna point out, um, as we talked about whether or not you want to do this work and how important it is, and if you need the qualifications, don't just go directly to the specs and look at the scope of work. Because a lot of entities, particularly the one that, I, uh, that are part of the task force, they have additional requirements. They've got federal guidelines that they have to follow. Some of them are, are state requirements as well. Um, and so with that comes sometimes an additional administrative requirement, right? You will need to do some extra reporting on maybe your workforce. Maybe you're going to be required to do certified payroll. Maybe they're going to want you to supply extra documentation monthly for any of the subcontractors that you might use. I, I am not sure, but they're going to have other requirements. It's important not to gloss over those. Let's take an example would be, let's go back to MSD. So as you see here, it says welcome and you see all these wonderful little links, but all these little links are telling you a lot of information. It's telling you what our supply diversity requirements are in our policy and procedures manual. It's telling you what our COVID communication and what our healthy at work regulations are now that would have to be included. Sometimes these administrative guidelines and these things require you to do something that you don't already do. It may require you to obtain a new service that you have not required. And that should be included, I would think, factored into whether or not you want to do this bid because it could increase your cost. 
Um, and you want to make sure that it's going to be worth your time and overall, and I've seen it happen several times where sometimes that has not been uh, accounted for. So um, sorry, I think I may have gone a little bit over, but switching back and forth from those sites took a little bit longer than I thought. Um, but thank you all. And um, like I said, most of those entities that I mentioned will have links on um, the plan room site. And um, thank you all for having me. I think that uh, Yvonne is next. little slow here you all thank you <laughs> um, okay thank you so much Kelly she is so full of information and um, as you all know it is uh, in doing this work sometimes it's very hard to locate what opportunities are coming up and that's one reason why we are staying very close to the Minority Contractors Association of Kentuckiana because that is the direct pool of folks that are really giving us feedback on what the challenges are and have been so that we can work collectively to overcome them. So I encourage you all to look up their website um, that's coming soon um, and also to reach out to Eddie Dunn. He's put his information in the chat because collectively our voices can be much stronger and we can overcome barriers together. And it's gonna take a heavy lift. One of the things that um, was brought out uh, at their meeting this week was how about making sure they know about projects when they're first announced before they ever get to the bid level so they can start getting prepared as contractors um, looking on um, their equipment side, looking on the labor force side, on their insurance and other things. Um, the other thing that we're working together on collaboratively is projects that don't have packages broken down to smaller packages that our um, local contractors can participate in. So just advocating with owners of projects to encourage them to break down their projects into smaller packages so that our small companies can get involved and our local companies can get involved. Remember folks, the more we circulate that dollar at home, the better our local economy is going to be for everyone. And so that's what we're working on. Next, um, I just want to say, um, a little bit about what the plan room is. So the plan room is going to be that place that you can come to as a minority business to get assistance with everything from, hey, how do I find the opportunities? How do I expand my opportunities? How do I go about filling out this paperwork that is required? Hey, my bandwidth at home isn't strong enough to download the plans or my bandwidth um, at my office is not strong enough, I'm not able to pull a full set of plans. Well, where we can, we will try to have a full set of plans in the office. Um, we will try to access plotters for you. Those are the types of printing equipment necessary to print off um, full scale plans. We will also work with our minority contractors to have a master contractor, which we will have in the plan room, who can help you with those takeoffs. So if you've been doing bids and you just can't seem to land a project because maybe the project owner has informed you, hey, your bid is always missing something or your bid is always out of whack with the other bids that we receive and we just can't seem to award anything to you. This is where you can sit with someone who can maybe go over your numbers and help you with getting your fine tuning your bid. Um, the other thing is, and this happened to me as a private business owner. You're dealing with, you are competing with folks who have very sophisticated packaging. What if marketing isn't your thing? What if you just don't know where to go for a reasonable price to put together a package that makes sense where you can actually address every line item requested in the bid and make sure you show a team that has the ability to do that job? Well, it's very important to get assistance with packaging. Those are things that we will be working on. What if writing is not your thing? What if you're just not a fancy writer and you're very concerned, hey, I can't even go to the bank and get uh, finance because I can't put together a business plan that the banker can follow. That is something that we can help you with. 
Um, and then I'm going into more technical types of things. What if IT, you start having computer issues and you don't know, you know who to go to to get it straightened out? Or what if your issue is insurance and bonding? You got to have someone that understands that. What if you keep getting turned down and you have issues? We recently had a, um, a contractor who the issue was banking. He was having trouble uh, securing banking, and um, we we don't go we don't go into judgment. We go into productivity. How can we help our folks who came out of prison but have um, definitely skill sets in the construction industry and would like to get back to work? We've got to be able to help people get back into the economy and be able to do business in the right way. So we're not we're not placing judgment. What we're doing is we're getting on the phone with bankers and we're saying, hey, we've got folks who are ready to do business. Do you want their business? Let's talk about how to get them bankable. Let's talk about how to get them with some accurate financial statements and let's get them moving so they can employ people. And we're hoping to employ people from the West End because that is our target. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're working with groups like MSD. The plan room will be specifically focused on the groups that are a part of the mayor's task list. And Kelly will tell you more about that later. But groups that have intentionality around procurement with minority contractors, we welcome them to the table because we want our, our contractors to do well. We know that uh, some of the MSD contractors are encouraged to do work with uh, the local communities. So we want to set up internships. We want to set up um, mentor-protege relationships, joint ventures. We want folks to really begin to work together. When you start looking at the spend, the overall spend in construction, folks, we can build wealth on the money that's being spent in construction. So we just really need to, to look at how to work together. The other thing that I'm happy to announce today is that Donovan Taylor will be joining the plan room as the manager, the plan room manager. So we'd like to give a big shout out to Donovan because we are so happy to have him on the team. This is a person who did the work. He met with the local entrepreneurs and he understood what it is our community has been saying they need. Listen folks, nobody has all the answers but we're going to do our darndest to try to address the challenges so that we can help people be successful. The other thing that I have to say is the, um, the board of, of One West has been working for over five years to try to make these kinds of things happen. So I just want you all to know that we are inviting the community we're, we're, uh, to the table. We're going out into the community meeting with folks and we know that the time to move the needle is now. We heard from our young people this past summer with the protests, and they just can't take any more rhetoric. It's time to move the needle and get folks working, get their businesses growing, make sure they have places to operate from, and make sure they have operating capital. And so this is what we're about, and we invite you to join us. The plan room is here. We're looking for professional services, and so is the Minority Contractors Association of Kentucky. Listen, you don't have to just work with one group. If you, if you are out there and you're an attorney or you're an accountant and you have skill sets that our businesses can use, we're all looking for you and we're excited to work with you. Um, the other thing is insurance companies, please come to the table. Our businesses need insurance coverage and don't think one-sided. One West is focused and the plan room is focused on contractors, supply side and design firms. We have a huge lack of design firms in uh, Louisville and African-American-led design firms, we are looking for you. We want you to participate in projects. One of the reasons you all have not seen um, a lot of construction from One West yet, we've been buying buildings, but now we're getting into the construction side because it's important that we know who in our community is here, ready and able to perform on projects. Eddie Dunn and a lot of other uh, contractors will tell you, we're working with our community so that they get an opportunity to be the people you see on the construction projects that we have going on. And so that takes intentionality and we're serious about it. Miss Yvette will tell you, we call her company up frequently uh, to make sure that our, our buildings are in the order that they need to be. And we're excited about that. So please um, come get involved, see what you can do to help us move the needle. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody on this webinar this morning.
Thanks for joining us. So we'll see you next time with the plan room.